Good afternoon, um, everyone, and thank you for joining the uh, today's Beza webinar. Um, first of all, as usual, um, um, before we kick off, some congratulations uh, to some of our members who have just passed their um, competence assessment scheme and audit. Um, one current member, Complete HVAC Services Limited, and a couple of new members that have passed their um, um, nicely rigorous um, audits. So thank you very much to them and congratulations to them. Right, um, sorry, so, I just wanted yeah. to quick stop you. Just wanted to make sure that everyone, could you please have your cameras turned off? Um, for some reason, we're able to see one of our attendees' um, boardrooms. So if you could please turn your cameras off, that would be great. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, so uh, today we are continuing our webinar theme, Ventilation, Delivering Buildings as Safe Havens. And um, today we'll be looking specifically at the building regulations and how they can shape this agenda. Um, the role of mechanical ventilation in making buildings safer and healthier for occupants has now been recognised by government departments and developers alike. And due to the pandemic, of course, the need to address and improve the indoor air quality has never been greater. But in practical terms, what does this mean for our members? In recent months, we've been using some of our BESA webinars to look closely at the future of offices, what changes we can expect from the new normal, and also from the approved documents part F and L in relation to these changes and how the changes to part F and L and the new part O of course will drive the changes necessary to achieve our net zero ambitions. So I'm very pleased today to be welcoming three members of the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities or DLUC as they're better known and um, will be joined for the Q&A session uh, shortly by um, Peter Rankin who's Head of Energy and Environmental Standards and Orla Wheeler, who is Energy Performance for Buildings Division, Net Zero and Greener Buildings Directorate. But first, to set the scene, I'm delighted to welcome the Technical Policy Lead at DLUC, Jack Hulm. So Jack, if you could unmute uh, yourself. Good afternoon. How are you today? Thanks. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Graham, for inviting me and uh, and hello to to everybody who's attending this webinar. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about to, to talk about our, our new standards. Yeah, um, thanks again. Yeah, it's very, so we're a very well attended webinar by the looks of it. So clearly there's a lot of interest in the new standards, which is good to see. So I'm sure we're all waiting to see uh, see what, what changes have come and I'll uh, I'll hand over to you now and I'll leave you to uh, do your presentation. I'll come back shortly. Thank you. Um, perhaps Graham or Charlie, if you could just confirm that that's being shown OK and you can yep, see the start fine. of my presentation. Brilliant. OK, well, I'll kick off. Um, so yes, well, thanks for the introduction, Graham. Um, uh, my name is Jack Hume. I work at the Department for Leveling Up uh, Housing and Communities, where I'm the policy lead um, for Part L and Part F, the technical policy lead for those areas of the of the building regulations which relate to energy efficiency and ventilation, um, particularly with an emphasis on non-domestic buildings. And my presentation today is going to be about non-domestic buildings. Um, I'm not going to talk about um, about, about housing particularly, um, uh, 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 but we're also running a, a series of events ahead of our ahead of the introduction of our uplift to the building regulations. So I'd encourage anybody who's interested in 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 learning more about today's subject or any of the other aspects of the of the uplift to to to, to keep an eye on our on our social media and other and other sources and I'm sure Bisa will keep you informed as and when other events happen. Let me see if I can change the slide here. Okay, so to kick off, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the building regulations and uh, where they where they apply. So they apply to almost all buildings and importantly, it means and importantly, they apply when building work is done. So that means when a new building is constructed or when specific types of work are done to an existing building. Um, an important thing to recognise with the building regulations is how they actually operate under what we call a set of functional requirements um, and in that they set minimum standards for what you should achieve rather than defining exactly how you should achieve them. So an example of a functional requirement might be um, to provide reasonable provision for the conservation of fuel and power, for example, or adequate means of ventil ventilation. The regulations themselves don't say how you should do that. That's for the building control body, um, which may be within a local authority or perhaps an improved inspector to determine how compliance against those particular functional requirements are achieved. Um, 
uh, but 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 they set these overarching functional requirements, um, uh, and 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 they form the the, the regulations themselves. Um, they are supported, and most of the work that most of the things that I'll be talking to about today um, relate to how they're supported through approved documents, which provide approved guidance. And the approved guidance relates, in particular, only to common situations. So um, the building control body has some discretion in order to say, well, okay, this guidance may not apply in a particular situation. So when I talk about standards and I talk about the standards in the approved documents, I think it's an important thing to frame that to say that these are only necessarily relevant for common situations. And on to our new standards. So on the 15th of December last year, we published our new standards uh, uh, in uh, a number of areas. So firstly, ventilation, and that was through approved document F and, the, and accompanying regulations. Uh, also energy efficiency with approved document L outlining the, the, the standards for energy efficiency. We also published another couple of documents that it's worth being aware of. I'm not going to talk particularly about those today, but also being aware that these were published at the same time. So a new set of standards relating to overheating, um, and that's uh, set out in approved document O. So that's overheating in, um, in, in, in residential buildings. I will touch on that a little bit at the end of my presentation. And also another one, another new approved document, approved document S that relates to infrastructure for charging electric vehicles. So those were all published at the same time. All of those standards and the legislation that come the behind them come into force on the 15th of June 2022. So, uh, so the middle of this year, these are the standards that will be expected to be met um, uh, in order to comply with the relevant elements of the building regulations. When we're talking about energy efficiency, those we describe as the in, either the interim uplift or an interim step ahead of what we call the full future homes and buildings standard, which should come into force from 2025. So this is a kind of a stepping stone really towards a, a more rigorous set of standards that will come into force from 2025. And I'll, I'll touch a little bit on those and, and, and um, what we've said about those and what the process is for getting those, um, getting those new standards um, put in place. Again, a little bit of background. One thing that um, you will notice when you look at the new standards and the new pro and, and the new approved documents is uh, uh, very much a consolidation and a simplification process. So, uh, central to what we are trying to do with the approved documents is to make them easier to follow, um, <clears throat> reword them in line with plain English um, uh, requirements, uh, and in line with what we say in, in the overarching document that describes how the building regulations work, which is called the Ban Manual of the of the Building Regulations. So those of you familiar with Part L um, in particular, and also Part F to some degree, will be familiar with the various documents. So um, currently under 2013 standards, there's L1A, L1B that, re that, that relate to dwellings, uh, L2A, L2B relating to, to non-domestic buildings um, in terms of whether it's an existing building or a new building. That's also accompanied by compliance guides. So all in all, we have, we have over half a dozen documents um, relating to one aspect of the building regulations. What we wanted to do with the interim uplift is to simplify these and really just have one part L for dwellings and one part L for uh, buildings other than dwellings. So we have now we just have L1, L1A, L1B compliance guides. They will no longer be required and no, no longer be appropriate for, 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 the, for the period post June 22. Um, L1 is the new volume for dwellings, and L2 is the new is the new is the new volume for um, buildings other than dwellings. But alongside that, we also have now F1 and F2, whereas previously there was only F, um, again related to dwellings and to non-dwellings. Uh, and again, uh, no compliance guide, so no domestic um, dom domestic ventilation compliance guide. So there's a reconciliation in order to help um, developers and 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 others involved in the process understanding what's requiring what's re required for for compliance. So it should be fewer documents to be, to have to refer to. Primarily, I'm going to talk about the uplift, the uh, standards that are coming in um, in the middle of this year. As I say, I'll touch a little bit on what's coming from 2025, the future building standard. Um, uh, but that's a kind of an ongoing process. And again, happy to take some questions about those uh, after after my presentation today. I'm going to start with new non-domestic buildings and talk about the energy efficiency standards primarily set out in in approved document L, um, L2. Um, and talk about what we are doing in terms of 
initially I'm going to talk about what we're doing in terms of overall target setting via, via the notional building and, and many of you I'm sure will be familiar with this process um, but talk about the metrics initially that we're talking that we that we're using in order to compare against the notional building and what we've done to that notional building in order to set more rigorous standards um, from 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 from, from that the come into force from the middle of this year. But start start off with the metrics and start off with the nuts and bolts really um, uh, this is how we set standards for compliance and the various the, mer the various metrics that we use in order to compare how uh, a building as design compares to what, what we set as our standard through the notional building the first metric that we use is carbon dioxide emissions um, and this helps drive low carbon choices as it says on the slide here and clearly an important driver something that we want to make sure that buildings are being built with low carbon dioxide emissions and this kind of maintains the metric that's currently in place and used under the 2013 standard but importantly for 2021 we introduce a parallel metric primary energy so um, this uh, compliance has to be achieved both against carbon di dioxide emissions and also the primary energy metric. Um, primary energy provides a measure of energy used in buildings, but also takes into account the energy that's used upstream. So it's not just the, the energy at the meter, which would be delivered energy. Primary energy takes into account the energy that's used upstream of the building itself. For example, it might take into account losses at the power station or within the distribution network if you're talking about electricity. So both carbon dioxide and primary energy will provide targets that will need to be hit under the new set of standards. Alongside that, we have our minimum standards for fabric and fixed building services. Sometimes these are referred to as backstop standards. Um, it's conceivable you could have a building with low carbon dioxide emissions and low primary energy, but not hitting these backstop standards. And that's make sure that that makes sure that any particular element of the building doesn't fall below a particular base level that we're setting through the uh, through the through 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 the uh, the standards in the approved documents. So those are the backstop standards. They re they remain in place. So it's really those three things that go to 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 set the standards. I'll talk initially about what we're doing through uh, carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions and the, the uh, primary energy emissions um, in terms of setting a um, setting an overall target for uh, for reduction. So through our consultation process that we ran in 2021, we looked at two different options for uh, CO2 emissions. Um, and we selected the option that provides the most CO2 emissions and acts as the best stepping stone to our to our future uh, building standards. So that achieves around a 27% decrease in CO2 emissions for a building compared to the 2013 standards. Um, but importantly, it has very high fabric standards, which is something that we anticipate coming in the future building standard, improved levels of building services and low carbon technologies, providing that 27%, but also providing that important stepping stone for developers and designers towards uh, what we anticipate coming in the future building standard. I've mentioned the notional building, which probably many of you are aware of, and um, really just to just to set the background for, for people who are perhaps less familiar with that. But under under Partel, under the energy efficiency requirements to achieve compliance, your actual building needs to match or better the performance of this notional building that sets the target. So the notional building is the same size and shape as the actual building, but it has certain predefined characteristics that help drive the type of building that we want um, to be able to comply. In practical terms, the notional building and how it's set up um, is, and 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 most people's interaction with it is through software tools. So um, often that'll be SBEM, a uh, simplified building energy model, or it may be an approved dynamic dynamic simulation model that you can also use for compliance. Those are the two different routes that are that are approved in order to achieve compliance and allow you to compare your actual building energy performance against the notional building. What I've set out in this table here, and I would, um, this is very much an abridged specification for the notional building, but hopefully gives a flavor of the sorts of things that we've done to change and to improve the targets, to, 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 to set higher standards through the new, new notional building. Um, this is included in a document called the NCM Modeling Guide, if anybody wants to get um, particularly into the detail. So that's available on the on the NCM website, um, which is the same website as you would download the ISBIM tool from for those who use that. So. The NCM modeling guide includes tables like this, um, and this shows the U values that we set within the notional building uh, in order to set this target. Now, 
if you are designing a building, you don't have to hit these values. The ones you have to hit are the um, minimum backstop values that I'll talk about later. But this gives you an indication of the type of building and the type of standards that you may have to you may have to achieve. So the ones highlighted there in the grey colour are where we've where we've increased standards, where we've changed standards. So we've uh, decreased U values for roofs, for walls, for floors and for windows. Roof lights, there's been a slight change in the calculation methodology. So actually that's a slightly higher value, but that's a bit of an artifact of the calculation. Also for vehicle access and pedestrian doors. So we're setting higher fabric standards really across the piece there for new buildings. Um, we've also uh, increased uh, the, the, the notional building um, air tightness level. So uh, we set a value of three. Uh, or five. I should have said that for the notional building, it depends the type of building that you're building. You you either describe it as a side lit building or side lit zone, um, and that would uh, be somewhere like an office or a top lit or a top lit lit zone, um, and that would be something like a warehouse. So primarily, we're increasing um, the, the 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 fabric performance for for side lit buildings, which will be buildings like offices. So just an indication there of the type of building and the type of U values that um, that will that will achieve compliance. As I say, it may be that you can uh, that you can achieve compliance by not not hitting these, um, but um, but achieving savings in other areas. Um, but one thing you do have to hit are the backstop values that I'm going to talk about a bit later. This is the um, equivalent uh, table for uh, for the building services. Um, so we've made a number of changes, again highlighted in grey, um, primarily to discourage the use of high carbon fuels. So the notional building uh, is modelled as mains gas with a mains gas heating system for any for any building that uses a fuel with a CO2 factor worse than gas. So what you can see on the left there is the fuel that's used within the actual building. So you'll see that there's a, a row there that says natural gas, LPG, fuel oil, smokeless fuel, coal, anthracite, etc. Now, if that is the fuel within your within your actual building, um, that will be compared against the gas driven system, hence making it very, very challenging to comply were you to do that. It's not to say it's impossible, um, but it will be very challenging to comply and you'd have to you'd have to uh, achieve savings in other areas for example, much improved fabric performance. Uh, we've also made a number of changes to discourage the use of on-peak electric systems in appropriate settings. Um, so at the very bottom there, if you have direct electricity, for example, um, for your for your space heating system, that'll be compared against a system that actually has 134% rather than 100%, which is what you'd normally expect with a, with a, with a direct electric system. Um, and that's because, again, to discourage the, the inappropriate use of that, making a very challenging target there, um, where you to, where you to specify um, direct electric in the, in the building. So again, this is how the notional building is working in order to drive the behaviours that we that we need to see in order to, to, to decarbonize. Another thing that's worth pointing out is what we've done with photovoltaics. So photovoltaics exist in the notional building um, for any areas not heated by a heat pump. So um, again, talking about top lit areas, um, that would represent 20% of what we call the foundation area. Um, for side lit, unlit areas, then that's 40% of the foundation area. Um, if you heat by heat pump, then you don't need to do this again to encourage heat pump take up. So you pro route those percentages down by the proportion of the space heating demand that's met by the heat pump. So again, within the notional building, we're setting a target by including photovoltaics, making a more challenging um, requirement. Uh, obviously, you can you can meet that requirement by putting in photo photovoltaics if you want, but there may be other mechanisms that you can use when you're designing your buildings in order to in order to achieve that 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 standard. Just a little word, word on foundation area. You'll see that's an input into the SBEM tool and your ISBEM tool. Um, the foundation area is the conditioned area, so that means the heated or the cooled area, divided by the number of stories in the whole building. So if you have an unheated area, for example, perhaps an unheated warehouse, then that doesn't come into the conditioned area and shouldn't be included within that calculation that you're doing um, of the foundation area. Again, that's laid out within the NCM modeling guide, um, uh, uh, within an equation that defines these things. But again, it may be that you interact uh, with, that, with that understanding of what the foundation area um, is through your software provider or through a, or through another mechanism. But um, just to recognise that there's photovoltaics within the notional building, you will be asked at some point for this foundation area, and that's what that foundation area is defined as, the conditioned area divided by the number of storeys in the whole building. There's a number of other changes. We've made changes to lighting to bring it into line with modern standards, different specs for high and low hot water demand buildings. Um, 
there's particular specification relating to existing heat networks, which incentivizes connections to existing heat networks, recognizing they can decarbonize, um, and also a new way of setting a target for new heat networks, connections to those. There are a variety of other changes, including to the glazing specification, heat recovery efficiency, and the performance of cooling systems. All of these are within the technical document, the NCM modeling guide, which is, which is uh, freely available. Um, but again, just to emphasize for most users, the changes actually really only become apparent via the modeling process using SBEM or using your DSM. That's where you'll begin to see how the notional building is setting you more challenging targets. But again, I would say, do have a look at the NCM modeling guide if you want to understand why perhaps you are getting a particular challenge with a particular building, why things might be difficult, and uh, that can also help you work a way around it. So that's kind of the notional building and the overall target, um, uh, which is which is one of our primary levers really for improving energy performance. Um, we also set these backstop standards. So these are minimum standards that have to be achieved, and this is to stop um, any trade-offs going too far, going beyond what we would consider to be um, a reasonable minimum standard for both fabric and, fil and, and fixed building services. This table here shows the 2013 values for new non-domestic buildings and the 2020 one values for new non-domestic buildings, and you can really see across the piece there, um, in, uh, decreases in new values, increases in requirements um, in order to to hit those backstop values. So these are the values that you can't go um, can't go below. Um, just to sort of emphasise uh, what I was saying earlier in terms of the notional building, um, if Picking on one of these uh, air permeability, for example, at the bottom where we have uh, a value of eight within the notional building, that's either three or five. So the notional building goes beyond the backstop values, but you will not be able to comply. You should not be able to comply um, unless you uh, unless unless you hit a value uh, air permeability value of eight um, uh, under the under the new standards. Also set minimum building services standards um, in, in in new buildings. So these are these are set out here. Um, just to just to highlight some of these, these are all within the uh, the new the new set of approved documents. Um, just to highlight some of some of some of these, the uh, increase in seasonal efficiencies for the boil for 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 boilers, um, increase in um, efficacy for the for the lighting. Another one really to highlight is the back system. So these are building automation and control systems that many of you will be familiar with. So new non-domestic buildings that have a heating or air conditioning system with an effective output above 180 kilowatts uh, should be equipped with a back system. So that's a that's a new standard that we've set within the approved approved document to have a back system installed. Um, Thermostatic room controls. So, uh, for for in, in many cases, for example, with a with with a with a wet heating system, that that would be um, TRVs. Um, they're also required in every every room or zone. Um, that's probably most of the changes in the minimum in the minimum backstop standard. Um, really, I can only summarise them here and just really to encourage you to go through the approved documents where they're laid out um, and to to understand where those where those changes have been have been introduced. Another set of standards that we um, have included within the guidance um, relate to submetering. So SIBSI's TM39 being the standard for new building submetering. And we uh, emphasize within the guidance about allowing the submetering to um, sorry the submetering to allow a useful comparison between design stage forecasts and measured results this is so building users can begin to uh, see if their building is performing as intended so uh, kind of to to support this we we, we have a standards in relation to submetering and for large buildings, we say that energy forecasting should be provided. So this could be provided through benchmarking um, uh, uh, or, or, or some sort of detailed modeling, such as SIBSI's TM54, which some of you may be aware of, aware of. But there's a variety of routes in order to do that, really just to encourage within the logbook that's that's provided with the new building to, to have this energy forecasting provided so that the ultimate building user can um, begin to compare how their building is intended, is forecast to be, to to, to perform to, to actual performance. So that's a bit of a whiz through there on the energy side. I'll just come on to some of the changes that we've made through part F, approved document F on the ventilation standards and the minimum standards that we set for ventilation. 
So I've only got a couple of slides on here, but just to emphasize some of the enhanced standards for offices and other rooms that we've that we've put in. I think one of the one of the most important ones to note are uh, relate to CO2 monitoring. Well, actually, indoor air quality monitoring is what we say within the guidance, but um, we do reference CO2 monitoring as perhaps being the most likely um, routes to 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 achieve this. Um, and this is set within the standards uh, and within the guidance uh, for for all new offices. And there's guidance there about what type of CO2 monitoring if you were to, to take that route. And also a new appendix that talks about um, how to interpret CO2 monitoring um, uh, when it's when it's been installed. There's also new guidance around recirculating systems. So systems that recirculating air should be capable of providing outdoor air only if needed, unless it has a very high level of filtering, such as uh, HEPA filtration um, or some sort of UVC um, type uh, cleaning system in place. So that's not to say that um, that those systems need to be need to be used. It just needs to be capable of having that type of system, that type of filtration, that type of cleaning system switched on. Um, uh, or, or be capable of providing the required outdoor air rates um, uh, uh, if if required, and 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 many of these many of these additional standards have been um, influenced to a large degree by by what's happened within the within the current pandemic, um, with the with the guidance being developed um, in conjunction with with advice that that that, that, that we've been taking on board from HSE and and Sage and others. The um, outdoor air rate for offices is now set in litres per second per metre squared, as well as in litres per second per person. Um, uh, and so that's set uh, at 10 litres um, 10 litres per second per person and one litre per second per metre squared for occupiable rooms in offices. We also set an outdoor air rate for common spaces that now includes corridors and lift lobbies. So this is set at half a litre per second per metre squared. So that isn't set per person, that one's set per metre squared, recognising that common spaces uh, don't don't have a have a more transient occupancy um, and the outdoor air rate there of 0.5 litres per second per metre squared. But importantly, that now includes areas like corridors and lift lobbies. Another change is that bathroom extract fans now have to be capable of being always on. Again, this was uh, a, a useful mitigation that was that was used within the within the current COVID pandemic to allow extract fans to be to be switched on all the time. So that's for offices. Um, there are also other rooms. Again, uh, very heavily influenced by uh, advice that was that was produced as part of the the current COVID pandemic, for rooms where um, infection risk is considered to be to be to be large to be higher um, during pandemics, but also during usual um, uh, non-pandemic situations for uh, for things like seasonal colds and flu. Um, so those are rooms where singing, loud speech, or aerobic exercise might might take place. So places like gyms low temperature and low humidity environments, so that might be uh, an occupiable cold store um, or where members of the public are likely to gather. So um, that, that could be a variety of, of rooms, but perhaps a, a sort of a place of assembly, for example. And within those rooms, we're also asking for indoor air quality monitoring to be installed in order to understand um, uh, how, how indoor air quality um, changes and again, potentially to take action under any future pandemic, recognising that these buildings that we're building today are likely to be around for many decades. A few other changes to ventilation guidance, uh, the consolidation I've mentioned um, into a new approved document F2, so mirroring the format of the approved document L2. Updated external references for other building types, those who know the current um, approved document F will recognise the uh, building types in one of the tables there. Uh, uh, and this is in table one uh, and this has now been updated. There's new guidance on noise from ventilation systems. Um, and I'd, re I'd recommend again, everybody has a look on Gov UK the, for approved document F2 or all of these approved documents are available in hard copy from Reba. Very briefly, just to go through what we're doing for existing non domestic buildings because approved document L, we don't have L2B anymore. We have uh, it's all contained within the same document within within approved document L2. So for existing non domestic buildings, uh, we also set minimum standards for fabric and fixed building services. And very simply, what we've done is we've aligned the standards. So the standards for new non-domestic buildings and for existing non-domestic buildings are aligned. So um, where we have uh, fabric standards, minimum backstop standards for a new building, that is now reflected in improved fabric standards uh, in an existing non-domestic building. Likewise, for building services, we've aligned the standards there. So um, these are the, the 
these these are the same standards for new non-domestic buildings as existing non-domestic buildings. So they're, they're again simplifying the guidance, recognizing that um, that 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 um, that recognizing that there's there is benefit and that in in simplifying the guidance in order to to make it clearer what the standards are and to have one set of standards across both new and existing buildings. As part of that, um, one of the things that we've done is to remove uh, heating efficiency credits that uh, were previously available and currently available under the 2013 standards. Um, that's not included because the efficiency of, we consider that the efficiency of appliances has improved since they're published and that the relaxations are no longer needed. Um, there's new requirements um, uh, ar around emitters. So um, uh, this is, of some relevance to non-domestic buildings, but it also mirrors guidance in domestic buildings where emitters are designed to run at 55 degrees or lower when replacing a whole wet space heating system. So this is to make sure that the, the system is, is, is effectively ready for a source of, of, of low temperature heating, which may, for example, be a heat pump in the future. So making sure that we're designing systems that are, that are suitable for that type of system to be installed in the future, even if it's not installed at this point. Um, there are, new there are new requirements about providing information around replacement systems and components to the building owner um, and around any backs or on-site electricity generation. So um, those are laid out in the approved documents. There are new requirements about providing that information and um, I, would, I, I would strongly recommend that people review those, those the, uh, that, that section of the approved document in particular in order to understand what's required when you're replacing a system or any, or any components. So that's kind of a, a, a very quick overview of the change in standards. Um, I'll finish off by just a quick whiz through the future building standard. Um, uh, and uh, I, 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 I anticipate that maybe some of my colleagues will expand on some of these points um, after, after I finish my presentation. Um, but this is the standard that's uh, expected to come in from 2025. What we consulted on last year was the, the uplift, the 2021 uplift that comes into force this year uh, for both L and F. And we're also a very broad outline of what might come next, um, the future building standard from 2025 for new non-domestic buildings. And this is what we said. We said, well, what should it look like and how should we implement it? We propose that it should be highly efficient on domestic buildings that use low carbon heat and have the best fabric standards possible, um, ensuring they're better for the environment, but for the future. And, and uh, following the consultation, we'll proceed with that outline of the standard, and we've committed to a technical consultation on it starting from 2023. We also recognise that for non-domestic buildings, there's uh, significant challenges um, in implementing that type of standard, um, and asked about how how this sort of standard should be brought in. Um, uh, uh, because of the varying end use and the terms of constructions type and servicing strategy across across non domestic buildings. So we've uh, now responded on that, say that we're going to introduce the, the FBS future building standard from 2025, but recognizing that there may need to be different timelines for different building types and we continue to work with industry in order to determine what those would be. Just very broadly, this was our kind of starter for 10, if you like, on the demand types, recognizing that there are those buildings that may have may be suitable for heat pumps, for space heating, with hot water, so maybe offices, maybe schools. Um, but there are those that's going to be more challenging. So if you have very high levels of hot water use, then is a heat pump going to be suitable in all cases? How, how are we going to set standards for that? But also um, there are some buildings, for example, some warehouses where maybe you have radiant heating, where it may be that heat pump for space heating is not necessarily the most appropriate solution. So those are the sorts of questions that we need to be to be working through as we develop the full future building standard. Uh, I'll whiz over this. This is just where 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 we came from. So we started um, introducing in phase one here the June 2022 uplift um, and a process now of engagement, uh, consultation and policy development ahead of implementing this, the new standard in, in around 2025 from around 2025. So that's what comes next. Um, but before I finish my presentation, just a couple of slides on uh, the new part O, um, because this may affect some um, some uh, uh, designers who are working in non-domestic buildings, because uh, the, the standard is designed for new residential buildings, which does include some non-domestic building types. So by this, we mean dwellings. So I'm not going to talk about 
of outdwellings, but there are also residential institutional buildings. So um, home, school or other similar establishment where people sleep on the premises, um, for example, care homes, um, uh, also residential colleges, halls of residence, other student accommodations. So although those are considered non-domestic buildings, they will come under the scope of part O. Very, very briefly, there are two methods of demonstrate compliance. There's, you know, we, 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 could, we could talk easily for another hour on part O um, and uh, we will be holding uh, particular presentations on part O and, and overheating, meet, uh, meeting this new this new requirement of the building regulations. Um, so if if you think this is likely to affect the type of buildings you work on, I'd encourage you to uh, to, to 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 keep an eye on 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 what bees were putting out and also what we put out at DLUC and we'll we will we will let you know when something relevant is 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 being presented but also to look at the approved documents that's available online. So finally this is this is my final slide just from the important information. So they come into force on the 15th of June 2022. There are transitional arrangements that apply, allowing previous standards to apply to apply for a period of 12 months and we may say a little bit about that in a moment. Um, for those of you that use our SBEM, the new ISBEM, the new interface is available from the NCM website. So that's UKNCM.org.uk. All the approved documents, L2, F2, and all the others, they're available now on GovUK and also in hard copy from Reba. Um, if you have any inquiries on the building regulations, um, please uh, feel free to send them to that to that email there. Uh, Particularly, we welcome um, uh, inquiries on the regulations themselves, on the approved documents. One thing that uh, we we are we're generally unable to help with, if you have particular questions about a particular project, then uh, that engagement should really be with the building control body, um, because again, they are the ones who ultimately say whether you comply or not. But we are able to to take comments on the guidance and the regulations themselves. Okay, so uh, that's it from me. I'll hand back to Graham, I think. Thank you, uh, Jack. That was um, really interesting. Um, the you probably haven't seen as you've been busy doing your presentation, but the uh, the chat box, as you'd imagine, has been inundated with uh, with questions. Um, before we get to them, though, uh, if I can introduce colleagues again. Uh, so, um, Orla Wheeler and Peter Rankin, if you'd uh, perfect. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, both of you. Thank you uh, for joining us. So um, yeah, an awful lot of information uh, in, in your presentation, Jack, and um, as has been been answered in the thread already, the um, recording will be on our website for attendees to to check back on afterwards. Uh, and I think um, once you've double checked your, your slides, that you'll um, make them available to the, the attendees as well. So much appreciated. Um, so going live in June, what about transitional arrangements for the new regulations then? Um, Orla, could you possibly talk us through what the transitional arrangements are, please? Yeah, absolutely. We introduced more stringent transitional arrangements than we've had in the past that apply to individual buildings rather than an entire development with a transitional period of a year. So what that means is if a developer submits an initial notice, a building notice or a full plans application to the local authority, before the regulations come into effect on the 15th of June 2022, then provided work starts on that building by the following year, 15th of June 2023, work on that building is permitted to continue under the previous standards. So as I said, it applies to individual buildings rather than the entire site. So if you submit plans for an entire site, but only commence work on that one building, it's only that one building that's permitted to continue under the previous standards. So it's a bit tougher than we've done in the past, but we're trying to strike a balance between getting as many buildings as possible built to the new higher standards, but also giving sufficient time and certainty for developers. Mm -hmm. And obviously the quicker we transition to that new higher standard, the better uh, all round for applying the new technologies, isn't it? So, so absolutely. Yeah, um, so the, the future building standards, um, when can we actually expect to hear the, the, the full details of, of exactly what's in it? And, and question is, will there be another consultation? Yes, yeah, so um, the consultation response that we published in December was predominantly focused on the 2021 uplift and most of what Jack's talked through today, but it did give some high level detail, which Jack touched on about our plans for the future building standard. So we plan on the standard being implemented from 2025. 
we recognise that there is a wide diversity in non-domestic buildings so that a phased approach to that implementation might be necessary but the expectation is that new non-domestic buildings will have low carbon heat, very high fabric standards and be zero carbon ready. There's a bit more detail in that consultation response about the types of low carbon heat we expect to see and potential ways in which we might approach the phasing of that implementation. Building on that high level detail that we gave in December, we're now looking to conduct a full technical consultation on the future building standard in 2023. So work to develop the technical proposals that will go into that is underway and we'll be continuing that over the next year. So when we publish that consultation, it will have much, much more detail about what we expect the future building standard to look like. And we'll plan on publishing draft approved documents alongside that as well. We'll be testing ideas over the next year with industry through working groups and other channels. So we're in the early stages at the moment and haven't finalised the scope. So I don't have much more detail I can share at this point. but. If you haven't already taken a look at what we published in December, I'd suggest looking there for a kind of high level view of what we're thinking at the moment. OK, that's really useful. And I think there's a couple of questions that have kind of come in that are asking about process for reporting errors in, in the documents and things like that. So that would probably be the, the vehicle to kind of address things like that. Or, or would that be a case of if it's an error with the approved document straight away to email the email that, that you had in your last Slack, Jack, uh, slide, Jack, would that be? The process yeah i think that's right i think if there's if there's something that within the approved documents that you feel is a uh, is an error that needs to be that needs to be addressed urgently then then absolutely do do um do send that send that um that that to the email address i'll, I'll drop that in the chat in a moment for people who do have have something like that um uh but yes yeah, certainly if there are other other changes then then certainly through the through the through the new technical consultation then that's where those things are 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 are, are easiest to deal with OK, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, from my side, um, it, really good to see indoor air quality being addressed in, in the, the new approved documents. Um, it's something we've been keenly engaged with for several years here at the BISA. Uh, and obviously, as was mentioned, as was touched on, the pandemic has obviously brought the uh, the attention of, uh, of importance of proper ventilation and things onto people's agenda and government's agenda, which has been nice to see. Um, there was an interesting bullet point that I picked up on and, and, and there's a couple of questions in uh, the, the the thread as well about it, um, about the systems that recirculate air should be capable of providing outdoor air only if needed unless HIPAA filters can be installed or UVC cleaning system in place. Um, I guess the way I was reading that, it left me thinking, where does that leave air conditioning systems which don't have the facility to directly introduce outside air? Um, but may well be significantly aiding the distribution of supply air into a workspace, for example. Um, uh, and kind of tying in with a couple of questions that have come in, why only UVC cleaning systems? And um, why not also allow or consider ionization cleaning or plasma cleaning? It does seem a little bit prescriptive. Um, the, the question in the, the, the box saying is HEPA filtration not excessive for recirculation filtration? Ash Ray and who recommend MRF 13? Um, and there was another one. Uh, yeah, what consideration was given to utilization of alternatives to HEPA filters um, to help overcome the high pressure drop, um, for example? Yeah, I yeah, appreciate yeah. I've given you an awful lot of information. There. Apologies, that's a very long winded question. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. So um, I, I think there's probably a couple of things to say. Uh, one, um, it, it, it's, it's about um, uh, the guidance is about the fresh air supply. And mechanical extract and ventilation systems. So there's nothing to stop you installing, um, you know, split units and and and, and VRV and cassette units. It, it, you, you shouldn't shouldn't worry too much about uh, uh, about that affecting the the aircon side of things. Um, in terms of uh, you know what what technologies are are, are acceptable, um, we. It, we, we, we did a lot of thinking about this during consultation and post consultation um, and we decided within the guidance to 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 cite uh, the systems that we thought had the best evidence associated with them uh, in, in in reducing infection uh, risk and spread within buildings. So we have set quite a high um, threshold there. I, I, I totally accept that. Um, 
but the guidance is also for common circumstances as well and, and if you did want to uh, uh, or, or if, you, if a designer is able to to demonstrate to their board and control body that, that the alternative that they've um, that they've chosen is is equivalent or better to that in the, in the approved document then uh, alternative um, alternative measures are, are are acceptable or can be through uh, through through that route um, but but generally um, if 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 you're not putting in a, a very high um, level of filtra filtration through through a HEPA system or or or, um, or, or UVC um, uh, filters, then then I would generally expect that that, that building control will be expecting a, a, an alternative um, means of of supplying uh, ventilation to give you full fresh air. Um, but it doesn't have to operate in that in that full fresh mode all the time. It's just to make sure that that that, that backup is there for for periods when. Uh, yeah, we may have a future pandemic in ten years. Let's hope not. But yeah, uh, but it's it, providing yeah. That resilience. I, I think too many people have learned too too much about uh, the spread of infection over the last two years. That the, I think future pandemics are un, undoubtedly going to be hitting us. So yeah, it's good to have that flexibility. I, I think in building design, isn't it, going forward? Um. Right. So I'm going to try and quickly flick through a couple of these shorter questions. Um. What consideration is there in the new and non-domestic requirements for listed and heritage buildings? Anybody want to take that one on? I can I can take that one. So so yes, yeah, so there are there are particular exemptions. So um, for listed buildings, I think there are exemptions around those. Um, for uh, now, are they different in Part L and Part F? Um, Peter, I'm not, can't, I can't remember, I can't quite recall. It certainly says at the front of the at the front of both of the approved documents, it says where the exemptions are. Um, I think that the, there is there is also discretion um, that um, building control have around around conservation areas where they're able to to relax some elements of the standard. So there are particular ex either exemptions or some level of discretion that's that's given around both heritage and um, and buildings in conservation areas. So so yeah, that is a, a you know a recognised thing that that that, that that's that um, that needs to be dealt with, and that that uh, building control will be will be familiar with dealing with those with those particular issues. Yeah, yeah, it's all it's all set out in section section zero, the the introduction section of of the of, of both the domestic and the non domestic approved documents. Okay, and and are the exemptions likely to change going forward? I, 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 I you know, <laughs> we, we 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 do periodically review the approved documents and the standards as we have just done. Um, I, I I can't I can't rule anything in and out of the scope of a future consultation. That that'll be that'll be a matter for yeah. for when when we're um, when we're developing um, a, a, a future consultation. But there are no currently announced plans to to um, to change those standards. But I think Fair I think enough. again. I think it, you know, that those sorts of issues are exactly the sorts of issues that we would encourage people to to put forward as part of any future consultation. If you feel the standards are are too rigid or not rigid enough, then that's the sort of message that that is really valuable for us to hear. Because um, uh, uh, because yeah, that's that's the point that those types of changes could potentially be made. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, what, if any, consideration has been made to balance off tensions between energy efficiency and infection control? That's certainly something that's been quite big on. I know our technical committee were really querying that during the consultation phase early last year. Um, and also there's another question actually that's coming about um, consideration to maintain and correct um, relative humidity um, levels for, for indoor air quality. This is to brief mention the documentation it says, uh, and obviously I think the the acknowledgement that the, the kind of forty to sixty percent relative humidity is 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 a golden thread uh, now, as uh, as Dr. Stephanie Taylor has said in the past. Um, uh, but obviously that humidity control may well bring an energy penalty effectively that would kind of go contrary to, to what we're trying to do with Part L. Um, has there been any consideration done on relative humidity? Yes, that was one of the things that um, came back through the through the consultation. Um, some uh, some some suggestions that relative humidity should be should be included within within some of the some of the air quality proposals that we we're putting forward. It was something that that we did consider, but we didn't take forward at this point. Um, 
it is something I think that 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 we that we are keeping an eye on. All all of all of the all of the air quality issues um, we have said, and and those who remember the consultation, there were there were other proposals that were put forward that we haven't at this point taken 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 on. Uh, it's very much a a a moving, you know, rapidly changing research background. You know, there's so much work going on in this area that um, that it may be within a year or two we're in a position where we want to change them and to introduce additional additional elements, be they humidity, be they NOx, be they, you know, particulates within that within that whole within that whole space. We wanted to start with CO2. Um, really welcome and value any additional research and any additional evidence about the benefits of including additional air quality. The the requirements around ventilation and this comes back to perhaps your first point, Graham, um, the ten potential tensions between between energy, but the requirements around ventilation uh, relate to an adequate means of ventilation for, for 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 people within the building, and so anything under that umbrella we can consider within within guidance, um, and the the tensions as such as they do exist, um, you know. All, all buildings to some degree are a trade-off. There are trade-offs throughout throughout a building design. And so there are, you know, but that but that requirement sits there alongside the energy assistancy. So so the requirement under what's called schedule one, under part L of schedule one of, of, of the building regulations that talks about conservation of fuel and power sits alongside ventilation. And those two we look at and we we have to make sure that we are looking at both of those at the same time. It's not one is paramount and is able to override the other. We have to look at all of the elements and all the requirements of the building regulations and make sure that they are that they are that they're being achieved. Um, so so there's no there is inevitably there's discussions and there's and there's and there's there's conversations. But uh, but the the case for ventilation will always be made and will always be made strongly and as strongly as any other case. Um, and and it won't be overridden by any by 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 any other element of the building regulations. Yeah, I guess that's that's good. It's good to hear. Um, obviously, the safety of building occupants is is going to be paramount, isn't it? So yeah, it's good. Um, Moving on a little bit, uh, when is the earliest opportunity for requirements concerning embodied carbon and net zero carbon emissions uh, for that to appear in building regulations? That might be Orla, yeah? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so in terms of net zero carbon emissions, the future building standard for operational um, energy and emissions is really the big thing that we're working towards. So that will be implemented um, from 2025 onwards and from that point on we expect buildings to be zero carbon ready so once the grid decarbonizes they will be zero carbon. In terms of embodied the net zero strategy which was published a few months ago sets out government's government's ambitions to help the construction sector improve the reporting on embodied carbon in buildings and it confirms that we're exploring the potential of a maximum embodied carbon level for new buildings in the future. Um, so the timeline for that is um, not entirely confirmed at the moment, but if you take a look at the next year's strategy, there's some more detail um, on it there and watch this space, really. OK, thank you. Um, another question, will these documents drive the review process of BB 101, um, particularly pushing for enhanced IEQ levels and reduced CO2 thresholds in school buildings? It's a very specific question that's been asked there. Yeah, it is. Um, I would say BB101 is um, it, it, it is owned by the Department for Education um, and 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 their, their their own technical experts. We we do work very closely with them. We talk we talk to them a lot. Um, I will be honest. Unless anybody else in the call knows of of of, of an imminent um, update to BB101, I'm not sure. But but we do. But like I say, we, we do we do share our we do share our homework with each other. Um, um, so, so if there are any if there are any inconsistencies, or we, 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 you know, we've, we've gone ahead of of BB one hundred and one, then then um, uh, then then I'm sure they'll take that into account in due course. Fair enough. Um, thank you. Uh, is thermographic testing still a requirement under Part L? Who wants to take that one? I don't mind. I don't mind taking it, Jack. If you want. Um, so th thermographic testing um, 
is 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 something that uh, that can enhance the the, the the sort of process of of of, of post completion checking, and great, we 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 very much encourage that sort of thing to happen. Uh, we've never had it as a minimum standard explicitly in in the approved document. Um, that's not to say it's not not beneficial, um, uh, but 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 it's never been a minimum standard for partly for the reason that that it's very difficult to to set an objective standard against thermographic testing. It's it's a uh, it's, it's a diagnostic tool really for 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 figuring out um uh you know where where construction defects might might have happened um but 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 the approved documents are are a set of uh sort of clear standards with 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 numbers and limits associated with them and and, and thermography um is is one of these things that that's that's like i say it's it's quite subjective uh can can help but but it's not uh it's not an ex not an explicit requirement set out in the in the approved document okay that's good to know um this is another the question that's that's just popped in that, that our members brought up quite a lot actually in in the um the consultation phase uh, about a year ago um there are specified ventilation rates for office spaces corridors lift wells um a lot of buildings uh, these areas are naturally ventilated so how will the rates be applied in naturally ventilated buildings that's often a problem for designers isn't it working that one out should I take that one? I mean, in, in relation to natural ventilation, so again, we um, we defer in that circumstance to the SIMSI guidance, so to, to AM10, and we, uh, I think it's AM10, and um, uh, we say uh, that that the uh, the natural ventilation should be should be in line with 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 that guidance. So um, yes, the the it, it kind of comes back a little bit to what the approved documents are trying to do. Um, it is for common situations and, and clearly natural ventilation is also a common, relatively common situation, but we can't have every single thing defined within the approved documents. So the approved documents are 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 defining are are defining a standard in in one area, but in 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 in, in other areas we say, well, okay, um, you know, for that for that particular circumstance, um, look within look within within the within the SIPSI guide, and I think that's SIPSI AM10 for for natural ventilation. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we are rapidly running out of time, as usually happens with these things, and the questions, uh, half of them still haven't been answered. Um, I've gone back to one of the earlier questions that came in. Uh, Jack, you mentioned in, in the, the presentation about the um, SBEM or NCM modelling guide being used. Uh, it's a question saying, uh, asking, has the NCM modelling guide now been formally released? <clears throat> yes, it has. So it's on the NCM website. Um, the uh, now where do you where do you go to it? I think you have to click on the download tab, which is on the left hand side, and you should be able to access it there. So if you kind of follow the route as if you want to download the latest version version of SBEM, I'm not certain if you need to provide a, an email address in order to 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 get to it. But it's um yes, it's on the it's on the NCM on the NCM web, website. Perfect, thank you. Um, the the, the same um, person has actually pointed out a gap in legislation. Um. I think from the draft version they're saying, um, particularly in relation to MOD projects, uh, which have different licensing arrangements for, for buildings on MOD sites, uh, clearly. Um, uh, the question is, is this a known issue and is there a plan to provide resolution? So I, I guess that would be another thing to take back to the consultation, the technical consultation. Yeah, so so um, uh, most MOD sites are exempt from the building regulations because they're owned by the Crown. Um, and, and 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 the building regulations doesn't um, uh, put requirements against them. The MOD do, however, voluntarily um, you know, have their own system of building control um, and 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 making sure that, um, that that people meet the the latest standards that that they set, which tend to bit which tend to align um, with ours. They tend to choose to uh, to to adopt our standards. Um, so I, I'm happy happy to happy to take that away and. Um, uh, and give a more detailed response to that to that uh, in, individual who's asked that question if they want to um, use the email address at the end of the presentation. That's, that's something we're perfectly happy to do that. Perfect. Excellent. OK. Um, well, um, as I said, as always, time's run away with us. Um, thank you very much, three of you, for joining us. Um, really, really informative, I'm sure. We've had a really good attendance today. I think I saw 250 attendees live, which is which is good um, for a Thursday lunchtime. Um, 
I'm sure the members will be feeding back into us for, for some time as well. Um, but I know um, the, your attendance has been very much appreciated. So uh, and by all of us here, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, thank you. Charlie, Thanks for having us. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, Charlie, could you pop up the um, the holding slide for the next webinars, please? I think the next webinar is, well, I'm waiting for that to pop up. I can look at my diary. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Charlie. So um, Tuesday the 22nd, um, uh, again, a really important subject about reducing fire risk in buildings. Um, and this is looking at how the uh, IoT is helping to address those issues. And then two days later, we have um, the start of our alternative routes to net zero webinars, which is looking at hydrogen heating. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing that one as well. Uh, from um, Fife Council who have been um, developing a, a project on um, hydrogen heating for some uh, some homes. So um, please do go to the BESA website as usual and sign up for these future webinars. And um, in the meantime, I will leave it there and thank you all very much for attending. And thanks again to Charlie for the, the back, back of house stuff um, as always very smooth. Thank you. Goodbye.